please give a warm round of applause for Mr. Rick Deskin. Yeah. Hello. Hello. So, uh, I was in the Air Force, I'm a veteran. Uh, served from 1984 to 1988, active duty, inactive reserve from 88 to 90. Uh, the thing about the Air Force is that, uh, you know, there's, uh, it, it's not as physically uh, intimidating as uh, the Army or the, or the Marines. It's more about uh, uh, nerds finding a place in the world. And uh, amongst the nerds uh, in the Air Force, and I, I respect all of them greatly, uh, I, I seem to be the, the, in the best condition because uh, I spent three years across country in high school and in the drama club. I knew how to dance. So, uh, you know, I, I, re I was able to hold my own there. Uh, so the thing about basic training uh, with, with any of the services is that it's about breaking you down and building you back up. And it's a lot of mind games. And specifically in the Air Force, uh, it was a lot of mind games. And I knew this going in because my dad had been in the Navy, so he kind of prepped me. So uh, one of the things I, I knew not to do was when they asked for volunteers, was to step forward and, and, and volunteer for something. Because usually you end up with something lame, like latrine duty, you know, cleaning up toilets. So uh, I, I uh, volunteered on my own for dorm guard monitor, which uh, was a skate kind of uh, duty. I basically made the schedule of who was uh, guarding the dormitory that we were in. It was a dormitory instead of a barracks, but it was, it was, it was aligned like barracks. So you're in a room with a bunch of guys, everyone's snoring, it's, it's mass chaos. So uh, uh, one afternoon, uh, this is during basic training, uh, the drill instructor comes in and he is doing a snap inspection. Well, I had been working on the, on the dorm guard schedule and uh, I hadn't had time to fold my clothes into little squares and triangles like they like me to do. So I had just thrown my stuff in the drawer. So I'm sitting, you know, we're all, we're, we all have to stand at attention at our lockers. And the drill instructor's coming by and he gets up to me he looks at my drawer, and my drawer is just like, clothes are all over the place. Nothing is organized. He looks at me for like, it seems like an eternity. And he goes, son, are you on drugs? And I go, no, sir. He continued to look at me for another minute, and then he just kept walking. Didn't do anything, didn't say anything else. And one of the things I found out before I even went in is that if you don't let what they say, you know, affect you or phase you, then they, they figure out they can't mess with you. And that's what it's a lot of, uh, uh, you know, it's all about, they're trying to mess with you to see if they can, if they can dig in and, and, and you know, shake you up. So, uh, fortunately, from that point on, I had this, this uh, uh, reputation of not being phased by stuff like that. So, uh, uh, that, that paid off later on in, 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 when I served in other places. So, uh, after basic training, I had security training. Now, they put me in security, even though I requested to go into broadcasting, because I was an actor, I've been in drama club, I was like, I want to do broadcasting. And they're like, well, we need you in security. I was like, well, that kind of sounds interesting. It's not what I want to do, but okay. So I ended up in security. So uh, uh, all of this training was in San Antonio, a very hot place from June to August. Uh, nothing like crawling around in the dust in uh, mid-summer uh, San Antonio. San Antonio. Uh, we were getting on our assignments uh, during training, and uh, I had wanted a California assignment because I had, had a girlfriend out there, and uh, they gave me Missouri. And I was like, I don't uh, really think there's anything for me in Missouri. And uh, while I was pondering this, uh, at the assignment board, there was this other guy from my squadron who was like, he was crying. He was like totally breaking down. And I go, like, well, what's wrong? He goes, my girlfriend lives in Missouri, and I gotta go to the Netherlands. And I was like, well, you know, since I can't go to California, I don't mind going to the Netherlands. That sounds kind of cool. It sounds more fun than Missouri. So I swapped. So I ended up in the Netherlands for my first uh, two years. And that was a cool assignment. At 18, being in a place where I had to live off base, I had to live in a flat uh, off base, and there was no drinking age. So uh, uh, I thought that was a pretty cool deal. And, and it was. Uh, uh, for the first two years. Then I made the mistake at 20 of getting married. And I did it because everybody I knew was getting married. I was like, well, they're getting married, so I should do it too, right? And you should never get married when you're 20. It's a big mistake. Uh, if you have and you're successful, kudos to you, but uh, uh, otherwise, don't do it. Uh, so so uh, my second assignment, upstate New York, frozen wasteland, Rome, New York, outside of uh, Syracuse and Utica. It snows from October to May, 
and uh, uh, it's like being in the Arctic, basically. They give you Arctic uh, gear uh, for, for, for your job. And uh, so I'm there in upstate New York, uh, uh, working midnight shifts. And what I did, basically, in security is I guarded stuff. Uh, and, and it was usually in the middle of the night. So in the Netherlands, in upstate New York, I'm guarding stuff out in the post by myself. So I gotta keep myself awake. So I'm drinking lots of coffee and reading Stephen King novels. Anybody read Stephen King novels? Yes, well, uh, nothing like reading something like The Stand, a post-apocalyptic tale, while you're guarding weapons of mass destruction. Uh, but it, kept, it kept me alert, kept me awake. Uh, you know, the slightest sound, I'd be like, you know, totally looking around, you know, what the hell is that? Uh, so, 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 I read a lot of Stephen King books, drank a lot of coffee, and uh, amused myself because, uh, because I'm an actor uh, and I didn't want people to mess with me. I would kind of do stuff to kind of uh, mess with people myself so they wouldn't mess with me. And so I had this uh, uh, reputation. They called me PR at my first assignment, which stood for punk rock, because at the time I had an earring. An earring, and I, I spiked up my hair and wore spikes and bracelets. And I was basically immersing myself into the Netherlands culture, which, you know, everyone was punk or new ways. And this was back in 1984, so, you know, it, it, it was pretty common. But because I was being such a good ambassador, in my mind, uh, to the people on base, the officers, they're like, we, we don't think you're being an example of a good American. And, and their example of a good American was someone that goes around in their cowboy boots. And, and basically expect people to talk English to them. And I wasn't going to be like that. I immersed myself in the culture to the point where people did not believe I was an American. So uh, I felt like I, 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 I had, had a victory there because uh, I was successful in, uh, in you know, immersing. Uh, now, uh, in New York, because it was uh, such a frozen wasteland, I was guarding B-52s. Anybody know what a B-52 is? Yeah. Uh, than a drink? Uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's an airplane, yeah. Yeah, it's a big, it's a big, 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 thank you. Uh, and, but I'm, I'm doing this in the middle of the night. So uh, people knew I was kind of weird, and I used to get up and talk to patrol cars and howl at the moon and just kind of, you know, move my reputation along, uh, mainly because I wasn't getting opportunities to act or perform. I was just acting out. But, but everybody thought it was kind of a little, a little crazy, which is worked in my favor. Uh, you know, there, I would be riding on a bus out to our assignments, and uh, I would just kind of look at someone differently, like this, and they'd be like, oh, Justin, give me the eye. Don't, don't look at me like that. You know, it was, it was that kind of situation, which uh, I, I was uh, uh, delighted by. Uh, but uh, they would ask me on the radio to do impressions of, of uh, horror film uh, 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 icons like Michael Myers and Jason from Friday the 13th. And I'd be out on the flight line. A flight line is where, where planes are, are stationed. And, and you know, with my uh, M16 on my back, uh, and basically uh, moving like a, 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 a zombie kind of character, like, like Jason, or, or doing something to that effect. They could see on their, on their closed circuit TV, and they were just cracking up. They thought it was the funniest thing. And they used to do impressions of me, uh, and because I, at the time I tried to have this really gravelly kind of, hey, this is uh, Airman Deskin, uh, reporter for duty. And so, so they, they, they would, you know, uh, mimic that back to me, and it was just hilarious to hear. Uh, so anyway, uh, 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 blah, blah, blah. So all the time I spent in the military was three years, eight months, 28 days. Uh, that was active duty, and active reserve was the rest of the time. And uh, I don't regret doing it, but I don't recommend anybody else doing it. Uh, it was very, a very eye-opening experience, especially the first two years uh, living in a different country. Uh, and um, yeah, that's about it. Uh, thanks for your time. Thanks for my time. I'm Rick Deskin. Uh, have a great night. And thanks for our veterans out there.